Hello and welcome to the live stream. Excuse me, I botched that. Welcome to the live stream edition of the podcast. First word out of the gate, and I already messed it up. Anyways, you're tuning in. I appreciate you tuning in. As you can see, I'm flying solo tonight. Bram Weinstein has the night off. He and I talked about a lot of stuff the other night after the game. So if you want to know what Bram and my thoughts and Bram's thoughts together were, go back and listen to the podcast after that debacle of a game Sunday. Also, I appreciate if you'd subscribe to the John Conn Report wherever you get your podcast. If you're watching on YouTube, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button. And if you're listening to this later, you want to find us on YouTube, go to Empire Media. That's A-M-P-I-R-E. It's always much appreciated. Listen, folks, as you can see by what I'm wearing tonight, got an Ohio State shirt on. I, too, need some therapy this week, folks. That was brutal. Now, I know there's a difference. It was still a painful ending. So we're all in that same in need of some therapy and some good kind of venting sessions here. So going to get to a lot of your questions. I have some questions from so, from Twitter, questions from you folks coming in and joining me live. And But for one thing I want to talk about, one one couple things before we get to the questions and all that. Number one on John Allen, defensive tackle, hurt his knee after the game. And my understanding is there was nothing major. So that's really good for him. When I last talked to somebody today, they didn't know if he was going to play Sunday or not. The fact that they didn't know is a good sign. I My guess is he ends up not playing. I don't think he'll play, but the fact is it's not a it was not a major injury. So that's good news for him and for Washington. You do not want to go in the offseason with any sort of major injury because then your focus is on rehabbing and not conditioning, et cetera, and it does put you behind because of that. So good news on Allen for all you folks. Secondly, the, the head game the other night was one of the more um, – or just this last month of the season, but one of the more disappointing ones that I've covered – in my time here, I think it, you know. I think it kind of goes back to maybe 2016 with Kirk Cousins that year, where they laid the egg against the Giants in the last game. That too was a team that I thought should have been better than eight, seven, and one. And when I look at this roster and this team, and you're around this team, there was a lot of really good chemistry. I mean, these guys enjoy being around one another, and that stuff does matter. And I thought it would pay off a little bit more, but what it turns out, you also need with chemistry. Is, is better offense and good quarterback play, whatever anybody wants to say, line play, play calling, all that stuff. You need that in addition to good chemistry because without the good, you can have some bad chemistry, but if you have really good quarterback play, then maybe it doesn't matter as much. But I do think it does, and I am surprised. That, and to me, this was a highly disappointing ending. And so I feel for you folks, that's why we got to do this tonight. The other thing is too, and I want to kind of just bring this up a little bit, is what my role is in covering this team. And I've said this before, and sometimes I don't know if people quite get what the role of a reporter is versus what some others can do. As a reporter, I am going to take a certain approach, and it's going to be a lot more even-keeled, a lot more even-handed than what some others can do. If you're a radio talk show guy, talk show host, you can take a different approach. You need to fill four hours. You're going to be a lot more opinionated than I am going to be because that's just not my job. It's not what ESPN wants. It's also not good for what my role is because if I start spouting off too many opinions on various things, then it, it can taint how somebody looks at it. If I sit there and say so-and-so should be fired and I write a story, is it because, and I write a story that has a narrative to it, and maybe it's, you know, is it deserved or not? And some cases I know you folks would say it is, but in other cases it wouldn't be. And so am I coming at it, if I have to write a story on this person later, am I coming at it with some sort of bias because people know I think this about this guy? So that's one, that's one of the things that people have to keep in mind when I'm giving opinions here or thoughts. And my job is to analyze. My job is to provide insight. I can take you places that you can't go. I can bring you information what's going on inside the team, inside the locker room. And that's what I that's what I like to do. So if you're looking for bombastic takes because you're all angry, you're not going to get that from me. And I'm, I'm not going to apologize for it because I've maintained a certain approach over the years. And it's one that's worked for me as a reporter. And I'm going to keep doing that. So, you know, and, there, and listen, I would say this too. If I say an opinion on something and you disagree, that's great because I don't think I have all the answers. I do think I have a lot of insight on stuff. But you're allowed to have a different opinion and to disagree. I've had those disagreements on YouTube with one guy today, and I thought it was very good because he had a different take, and that's fine. And I can explain myself, and that's fine too. So, anyways, just wanted to clear that up. Now, enough with that. Let's get to some of your questions. So, all right, let's we're gonna start with Tom Vaccaro. If the front office 
is this saying because of ownership, should drafting and trading up for quarterback be off the table due to likely staff turnover? Well, that's a good question. I think you kind of go back to perhaps like when they drafted Dwayne Haskins. And one reason why that there was some hesitation with it is just because you kind of knew that Gruden, that going in that year was going to be on the hot seat. Would they turn around? If not, you knew he'd be gone. And then you have a quarterback with the next coach want that guy. My take always is if you think the guy's that special as a quarterback, I think you take him. And you're just depending on who that is. You know, if Joe Burrow, if you're Cincinnati, you're taking Joe Burrow, whether Zach Taylor's on the hot seat or not, right? And so I just think it depends on who that guy is. I think it's a good point, but I think you do. I think it also depends who's making the decision, because if you're Ron Rivera in that front office, they're going to take what they think is best for them. If, if somebody else, if the new owner comes in and says, no, I don't want you taking that guy because I want another coach, maybe next year taking it, well, then that's what they're going to have to do. So I think that's a wait and see. I do, I do understand why you're asking that um, because what if something had goes wrong and, it, and it, now you have another coach. And I do think like in the Haskins situation, um, when, when Rivera came in, they felt like they had to stick with him because it's what Dan Snyder wanted. So they knew they had to stick with them and it may, and it prevented them maybe from doing a deeper dive on Justin Herbert or Tua. Now I do, th- I do know they looked at those guys and I do know that there were questions about both. So it wasn't like they were a slam dunk regardless, but if you don't have that quarterback, you probably have been more aggressive looking at one of those two. Anyway, understand the question. Good question. Jay Kurt 20 says, do you think Ron will evaluate his coaching staff? I think we can do better than Scott Turner. He just doesn't have feel slash momentum of the game. Yes, I do think he'll evaluate the coach staff. I think he does it every year. The question is, will he make a change? And I don't know about that. I got a lot of questions about this. A couple others I'll probably get to. But yes, I do think he'll take a hard look at it. Because here's the reality, folks. This is going to be, we're, let, we're now assuming that he'll be back. And part of that would be because the ownership change, right? Because it's going to be hard to make a change there. And I got questions about that. But I do think that um, that, you know, so let's say he's back. So if you know you're back, he's been through this before. He knows he's going to have to win to stick around. So because he's got a new owner, he had the new owner in Carolina. They didn't win enough. And within his, within his first year, he was gone. So I think he understands that. So I do think he's going to look hard at that. Um, whether or not he makes a change, whether or not he, maybe he brings somebody else on to, um, and I talked to somebody I really respect who talked about maybe bringing some sort of passing game coordinator on, somebody to help with that. But I really think there needs to be a sit-down discussion of this is what is expected from this is, if I'm Rivera, I said, this is what I want from the offense. This is what I think we need to be. And if we can't, if you can't adhere to that, then we got to go our separate ways. That's what I would say. Now, keep in mind, Scott Turner just signed a three-year deal last offseason. So then if, if they say, well, we're going to – if Ron Rivera goes to – because right now we have to go to Dan Snyder and say, I want to fire Scott Turner. Then, then Dan Snyder says, well, I don't want to pay the money. So then what are you going to do? So that's, that's also a possibility, folks, that that's where this in being in limbo can, can really impact things. But bottom line, I don't know what they're going to do. I do know they have to sit down. They have to discuss all this. And I do know they need to get on this quote unquote same page about what they and how they see this offense, because I think, and somebody else asked me this too, but I do think that there are times where is there a disconnect? I do think at times there has been, I think you can see it on the field. I think you can hear it when Ron Rivera talks to the media, some of the questions or some of the things he talks about um, and the desires of what he wants, what he wants the offense to be, the identity, et cetera. It kind of has, it's, it's oftentimes runs counter to what they were just doing the previous couple of weeks. So, yes, I think he'll sit down and evaluate the staff. Thank you, Jay Kirk. All right, now we got John O. How much does the coaching staff get the blame here? It seems these years slash games are the same. Listen, the record is what it is. You're only winning seven games. The coaching staff deserves a lot of the blame. That's the bottom line. I also think that when you're you're looking at it, you also have to look at the front office. And Bram and I have talked a lot about this, about some of the stuff they did in the offseason with – Things that were addressed and weren't addressed. And I think the single biggest issue was the offensive line. I would, and I, and the other thing that I was mainly con- really concerned about was the. I, I figured it, I, I talked a lot about secondary depth, but really, especially at corner, Derek Forrest emerged in the spring as a guy like, oh wow, it looks like he could be better than what we thought in his second year. 
So that was good. But at corner, you really didn't get that. Now, St. Juiced emerged, but William Jackson initially looked good. And then when they started playing the games, he looked back to what he was. So that depth there was the big issue. Hard to address everything in one year. I think linebacker kind of got the short shrift last year. You can't address everything. And that was definitely a problem spot. I do think they'll want to address it this offseason. Absolutely. It may be by bringing Cole Holcomb back. It may be by doing that and drafting someone else. To me, you've got to get another young guy in the pipeline behind those two. Not just a young guy who can play special teams, but somebody who can elevate to play if they need them as a third linebacker or if one of these guys gets hurt, whatever. It's a better quality depth, I think, is what you need. So, But I do think offensive line was a problem. So that's why I say, yes, the coaching staff gets blamed, of course. When you look at the offense, I think there's definitely games you can say, was that was that the best game for the for the offensive coaches? Well, no. And but then I also look and say, well, what kind of line is there? What about the quarterback? How much of that? Where, where does the blame? How do you assess all that if you know that the quarterback plays a certain way or that the line is a certain way? It clearly impacts what a coordinator can do. <clears throat> and but having said that, I do think they get blamed. Of course, they're, it's their they're, it's their product they're putting out there. You can't always just say it's on the players because your job is to either get the players, to coach them. If not, then you got to change it or you got to change what you're doing to adapt. Not always that easy, but yes, the, the answer is yes. Of course, they deserve some of the blame. Sean Garner wants to know, when will Ron name the starting quarterback for Sunday's game and who do I think it will be? I do believe tomorrow, last week with, with um, Carson, with Car- naming Carson, they did it at like, it was a, sh- a few minutes after 8 a.m. Because they have an early, mo- they have a meeting early Wednesday morning. So I do think you'll know probably tomorrow morning, right, if I had to guess right now, it's going to be Taylor Heineke, but then with um, Sam Howell coming in in relief. It will not be Carson Wentz. Take that to the bank. But the question is, do you go, do you start Heineke and come in with Howell or do you start Howell is he, is he, you know, do you want to limit expectations for him? Not limit expectations, but maybe limit some of the pressure on him and kind of treat it as almost like a preseason game for him where he comes in in relief. But regardless, I think you're definitely, I would say almost assuredly, you're going to see Sam Howell on Sunday. It's just a matter of does he start or does Heineke start? And then they go from there. And you know, the other thing is that's a really tough defense that Dallas has for a, for a guy to face in his first, first game. So you Dallas was at 10th. I think it's like 10th in passing yards, third in sacks. Um, I think it's second in, in – in, no, they're top 10 in interceptions too. So, in other words, they're really good. And you have Micah Parsons. You got a really good defense to, to or defensive um, uh, pass coverage. So I think it would be awfully difficult. But, you know, I think it's going to be good for Howell. Just like everybody else, I'm curious to see what the guy looks like. Because, I, you know, we saw what we saw this summer – it was a guy who I thought progressed early in camp. I did not think he looked anywhere close to being ready to be even a backup at that point. And I thought he slowly progressed throughout camp. Now, I know we've talked. I had him on the podcast a few weeks ago. If you want to go back and listen to that, he talked a little bit about what things that he was working on. Footwork is chief among them. And I don't, you know, I don't think I, you know, my understanding is there's still rawness to his game. Um, but, you know, Get him in there, get him some reps, see what he can do. What you don't want to do is put a guy out there too early, but I think in the last game of the year, I think he'll be okay. I do think that he's a guy that I'm intrigued by going forward. To what degree? I don't know. I don't know if that means that he's going to be a starter down the road or does that mean he's going to be a good backup, but I do think he's got some skill. I think he has a little bit of swagger, and my understanding is that he's kind of showing a little bit more of that swagger lately. So that's his game. So, But anyway, Sean, that's who I think it's going to be. But I am, I like everybody else, I'm curious to see what Hal does. I just never thought you should start him unless they were in this situation, which is out of the playoff, out of the playoff um, report. Eric Long wants to know, who do you think, who do I think the players want to start a QB next week? <laughs> Honestly, I'm not sure that it matters. And listen, I guys want to win. Um, they're going to say they all, when we're going to the locker room, they're going to say they want to win. I think you know. I do think they. I do think they do want to win. So I think, and in, in, I think they probably prefer a Heineke at this point. So I think we saw that Carson Wentz just didn't get it done for them. But when I when I go back to saying they want to win, I go back to um, 2017 when it was Kirk Cousins going to be Kirk Cousins' last game, and even though at that time he said, "Well, he hadn't made his decision," well, we all know what it was. So or what it was going to be. 
But they go up to the Meadowlands and they were seven and eight. They had just lost to be eliminated from the playoff contention. And they talked all week about how they didn't want to, they wanted to finish with another non losing season that eight and eight really mattered. And, you know, oh, you don't want to go seven and nine, blah, blah. Well, the Giants hit a big run in the first series. You could just say, yeah, maybe seven and nine is not so bad. So that's how, that's kind of how it felt watching the game. Like that whole talk about being eight and eight and how much it mattered within one series, that was out the window. So I do think like, you know, so I don't know that it's going to really matter um, to them as much. But then, I, but here's where it could matter, Eric, is if you're playing a rookie and you're not getting the ball and you're, you're McLaurin or something like that, it's like, well, how much do you want to be in that last game or do you just want to get to the offseason healthy so you don't have any issues to deal with? Um, you know, so I think that's, I think that's something um, to, to, to look at or to consider. Tim Fwasi, do you think, wants to know, do you think Ron Rivera is over-optimistic about the state of the offensive line and back seven depth of the roster? Oh, I don't think, I, I think he understands, I'll be honest, I'm, I'm pretty sure they understand that they need to upgrade that line. That is, you put that on the priority list for the offseason. So going into the offseason, that would be one of the top priorities based on what I've heard um, for them going forward. And I think the, you know, um, the back seven depth of the roster, if you're talking about like the DBs and all that, I definitely think that corner is going to be another area they're going to address. I do think they'd like to get another safety in there, but I think corner is going to be a primary one. And again, I already mentioned linebacker. So yeah, I think to me, what they have to do is rebuild, get some stars in the offensive line. And I think they know that. I mean, that's been my understanding. So it I wouldn't be shocked at all if they get a couple linemen um, somehow in free agency and or the draft. I think you're going to have to get at least three um, quality guys in that in situation. But that's why going back to playing guys playing Sunday is um, Chris Paul. I want to see Chris Paul because I've heard good things about him. Does he factor in the next year? If so, how and to what degree? Is a backup? Will they consider, again, another guy they consider very raw? So do they look at him as a future backup next year or a guy who could elevate to becoming, who could contend for a starting job? And then if so, how does that, that impact what you do in, in free agency, et cetera. So I don't think he's overly optimistic about that offensive line, to be honest. And I think he's, I think there's some realism about the back depth as well. So, but that's a good question, Tim. And so I think, I think it's something that is, is certainly worth, you know, wondering as we go forward, or at least, um, you know, good question. So I want to read a couple off of Twitter, and this is from Rush Manual. And this is going to go back to what we saw in Monday Night Football um, with, with the situation with the bills and all that just very heartbreaking. And so, you know, but I want, I want to address it just for this reason. And TM wants to know as someone who went through the Sean Taylor tragedy, you have a unique perspective on what the bills and Bengals beat reporters are going through. I think viewers followers will benefit from your understanding of how you go about doing your job respectfully and ease back into normalcy. And I appreciate the question. And the one thing I'll say, and not making it about the beat reporters, because obviously you're second, you're not even secondary, you're, you know, way on the outside here but you are observers and you are around these people and you do get to know these people. And one of the things I kept thinking is like, who, you know, if something like happened that to one of these players here, how you would feel like you're in the locker room talking to these guys, you get to know them, not everybody, because it's hard to get to know all 53. But the difference here is that they saw this happen live. We didn't see what happened to Sean Taylor. We didn't see that. If you see it to me, it affects you differently. So I can't imagine being a beat reporter for either one of those teams or anybody at that stadium who saw that live and then saw not just what happened live, but saw the way the players were reacting and just like, I just don't know how you ever let that go. For us as reporters, you know, it was the weird part was it happened and, you know, we didn't see anything, but we know these players, we were talking to these guys as they're, they're in tears talking about a guy they loved and their teammate and, and just the shock and all of it, but not just the players and all that. It was everybody in the building. I remember the PR staffers, coming out with their eyes just completely puffy and red because that's all they've been, all they were doing was crying. So I just, I don't know. You kind of go by how the players feel about it and you kind of go by their, um, you gently go by how they, they, you let them take you where they're going to go and, and when they're ready to talk about it and, and et cetera. And I just remember how eerie it was to be back in the locker room and seeing his locker and trying not to just look at it and just like, cause it just, it shakes everybody. But I just I think a difference here is that they saw it live and they had to deal with they're dealing with something far different. And I, I would feel like I would probably it would affect me a lot differently, too. And I wasn't watching him. I was watching my actually my Cavaliers play. 
But then you see, I'm watching social media, you see everything on there. But I just think seeing it live is going to be is going to add a different layer to it. And, and that's just going to be something that to me is hard for everybody to deal with. And hopefully, hopefully he pulls through and it's just, you know, it's, it's, it's horrible. Um, and strictly speaking, and I, and I actually answered this earlier about a disconnect between what Ron wants the offense to be and what Scott wants it to call. Would a parting of ways be mutually beneficial for the team and Scott? Are, or are we so unable to accurately judge based on the QBs this year's old line? I do think that plays into it. But I also think there's a philosophy that you have to adhere to. And if you're going to run play action, do all that, you can't be as predictable. You can't be, you know, you can't know that 85% of the time that you're in this package under center, that you're going to run the ball. Or if you're in gun, you're going to throw the ball. It's got to be a little bit more balanced, a little bit more nuanced offensively. And I do think that there's an understanding by other coaches there that that has to improve. Um, but is it all on that? Well, no, because, you know, you there. I've seen plays. That I'm like, well, this is open. You know, so why didn't you hit it? But then, like, there's the fourth and one pitch yet on Sunday, where is it? The, I didn't. I did not like the call live, but when you go back and watch it, to be honest, and Terry McLaurin has done a lot of great things this year. He missed the block. That's his guy that cuts shoots through and makes the play. Got to make that block. But I still go back to you have a power back in Jonathan Williams. You got beef up the middle, and you're facing a small defensive front. They were crunched to the middle, but I would have taken my chances running over there. And so that, but that's, that's a play. When you're talking about an offense, that's different. Play calls are going to be, everybody's going to have a bad play call. And I think that, you know, and you can argue that again, I still would have gone up the middle, but everybody's going to have a bad play call. But then to me, it's like when you're running play action, you should be a better play action team. Why aren't you? Are you marrying the concepts the right way, et cetera? That's one of the things you hear when you talk, when I talk to people far smarter than me about this sport, that's some of the stuff you hear. But is it, you know, but I do think, is, 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 there, is there a disconnect? I think there was, to me, I sensed one, or or at least you could see just based on some of Rivera's comments to the media and just the growth that they wanted to see from the offense and early in the year compared to middle of the year compared to now and, and et cetera. So you have to look at everything. I don't know that we're at a, I don't know that if a mutual parting the ways is beneficial to each party. I don't, I don't know that. Scott, again, Scott just signed a three-year deal. And, you know, again, you can't when you're when you're dealing with some of the the line and quarterback issues, you can't just you can't ignore that. And I know people want to, but I know that way back in the day they didn't want to ignore certain things when Kyle Shanahan was here. And I'm not equating the two. Kyle to me is in a different different class. Sean McVay is in a different class. You know, I think they were they were different guys and, and special. I think their offenses always made sense to those who played in them. So, but I do know that there's going to be some talking to and just. I don't know where it's going to go. Um, I don't know that anything's going to be decided. I don't know that anything, I don't know that Ron Rivera is tr- even thinking about doing anything, but I know that there will be discussions because I know that that is something that has to get fixed. We all know that. And I do think it starts with having a strong discussion and seeing, are you going to be on the same page or not? So good question. And it's going to be a topic that I'm sure we will talk about more than just tonight. So I get a couple more from, from Twitter. Um, Quarterback questions. Oh, man, there's a lot of them. <laughs> do you think the commanders will try? This is from Marvin Eaglehawk. Do you think the commanders will try to bring another vet QB or possibly try to trade up to draft one? Seems like the vets don't either don't want to be here or just aren't good enough to make a difference. Well, they haven't made a difference. We've seen that. But I, I think you're going to keep you ha- until you get it right. You've got to keep find, trying to find a guy. So will they go after a vet? A couple things I could see. Now, Heineke's a free agent. I could see them. I do think they would want him back. Whether or not he wants to be back, I don't know. So then you, if let's say you have him, you could bring in another lower cost veteran because you are you going to take a big swing? People have brought up Derek Carr. Derek Carr's contract is outrageous. I'm not, I'm not taking that. It's 33 million next year and then 40 some the next year. My guess, I wouldn't shock me if he ends up being free if he's cut. Because do you really want to pay pay that kind of price and then have to pay that salary? You know, draft picks and then a salary? No, thank you. So I don't know. I would not do that. So are you looking at a Jacoby Brissett or, you know, and I don't know that that's the guy, but like, I'm just throwing out a veteran guy who, who was shown like what, what he did with the Browns was actually not bad. You know, he was not the reason they were losing. So, you know, it was a defense. So if you, if he, if you put him on what they had this year, they probably, they might be a little bit better. I don't know. Do you bring those guys in and let these guys compete? Maybe, maybe that's what you do. I would also not, if you're not doing that, I'm going to look hard at that first round pick just because, you don't have a guy. And I think you've got to keep swinging until you find them. 
Um, but again, that goes into a lot of questions because of the pending sale. Um, let's see. And I know, let's see, Jason Berger wants to know, I know what the owner situation, it isn't likely what are odds that Snyder makes a change third straight non losing season. Again, sale of the team, I think precludes that. Michael Collier says, what percentage is Wentz back next year? Um, zero. I, there's no way he's, his, his, his number is 26.7 or 26.2. I think it is 26.2 or 26.7 million next year. No, he's not coming back. He hasn't shown any reason that he should be back. And, you know, they know that. So it's going to, it'll end after one year. And let's see. A lot of this. Um, Wallace. Okay. I'm doing, this is a selfish one. He wants to know reasons for not starting Sam and the last thing I cooked in my smoker. That's why you want to get me to answer a question, man. The easiest way is to say, what did you smoke this week? So that's why that Wallace, you're a smart man. I think you've done this before, but you're smart. So as far as, far as not starting Sam, good question. I did kind of address that earlier about Dallas's past defense, but even if he goes in the game, he's going to have to contend with that. I do think there may be a, maybe not wanting to have any sort of, I think they're aware of what people have wanted to see him. So do you want to limit quote unquote, I hate to use the word hype. He's a he's a fifth round pick. I know fans want to see him because he hasn't played, but do you want to limit some of that on him and just let him kind of ease into that by starting Heineke and going there? I think that's why if they if they go that route, I think that's why they do that. So um, yeah, I think that's probably why. Can you elaborate on my ESPN article? Was the front office preference really to restructure Wentz on a scale of one to ten? How likely is he? Well, we just answered that. And this is from Justin Check. How likely is Wentz to reach an extension restructure after that dismal performance? Well, I already answered that one. It's a big fat goose egg to me. I just don't, I just, I just you can't. It, they, they know that. Um, as far as the front office pre preference to restructure Wentz, I don't, I'm not sure, <laughs> excuse me, I'm not sure what you're talking about. I don't, I think if they had, if you're talking about for the future, that's not going to happen. If you're talking about why they didn't do it at the time, um, because here's the thing, if you really have that level of confidence in the guy, to me, they would have probably done something at a time to give him some guaranteed money going forward because he has no guaranteed money. The other thing is one reason why, you know, with, again, with the salary, one reason why he wouldn't play Sunday in addition to the fact that he didn't play well, they're out of the playoffs, but he also has, there's $4 million guaranteed money if he gets hurt. That's the only guaranteed money he has. Guaranteed for injury only. So you don't want to put any money on the salary cap for somebody who's not going to be part of your future. Um, so there you go. Let me get some more in here. A lot of quarterback questions. Casey Mosley, I believe the commander should roll with Heineke next season and use the draft to strengthen the offensive line. Well, that's not really a question, Casey, but I I'll, but I'll talk about it. I think if you if he comes back, you're gonna it's gonna be part of a competition. I don't think you can just roll with that because I don't think that's going to be something that I think players know the limitations here. And so I, I while while everybody likes him, I think you're going to have to, to at least, if nothing else, just competition. So whether it's he and Howell and somebody else, I don't think you can just have those two and just say, hey, you're settled there. Because we don't know what Howell can do. Again, I still hear that there's like he still has a little bit of ways to go. A lot of work had to be done. And is he really going to be a guy that can go from that to being a starter next year? based on what I'm not saying it can't, but based on what have we seen to go there? So, you know, so I'm not, I, I'd want, I'd feel more comfortable if you bring in somebody else along with those guys in whatever fashion is, but, you know, um, but I don't think, I don't think, and, and Patrick, Patrick Lugo says, Casey, Patrick Lugo says he agrees with you. Um, so there you go. And others play blame bowling, solid plan. I just I don't think I think what he has shown is he's a high quality backup. So I think if you really want to do something, I think we've seen what we've seen. The offense was not producing in the red zone. He was part of it. And I love the story. And I love talking to Taylor. He's one of my favorites. But I do think that you have to look at all that. And I would and I'll just say this. You need to try an upgrade. What I wouldn't do is force the upgrade now because you do know what he can do. And if you go out and get somebody else to pair with them to in, just in case. Um, or in case Hall doesn't develop, I'm good with that too. But, you know, I wouldn't go overboard getting a Derek Carr and just pinning all your hopes there and paying him an exorbitant fee um, to do that. And he is a guy that they inquired about last year. Anyway, that's, you know, that's just my thoughts. But again, they, I know how they view him as a, as a high quality backup and there's, there are worse things to be called in life, but I don't think you want to go there and say for 17 games, 
this is the guy you're going to roll with. I don't think that that's where they're at. Um, so anyway, um, let's see. What else do we have here, folks? And Jason Jones goes, and we just talked about it. Is Derek Carr real possibilities or more realistic for Jameis Winston type? I don't think Carr's a real possibility, again, for all the reasons you said. Jameis, I don't know. Um, you know, we'll, we'll see. I think a guy like that, you know, again, I, I bring up Jacoby Brissett. It's funny because I had somebody tell me two years ago whom I really respect who thought like, oh, Jacoby would be a really good fit in Scott Turner's system. And now they, to my knowledge, they didn't really go after him hard. So I don't know that. And I don't know why I keep bringing him up. But, you know, I know he's a veteran quarterback who, who may or may not be free. Um, but I think you're going to get a, that kind of style right now. But who knows? This is We're not even done with the season yet. So last year at this time, who knew all these guys that would be available? So, you know, um, so I think that's a stay tuned for that one. Here we go. Something different. Juan Quiros wants to know, what are the chances they resign Payne? Do you think he wants to come back to this mess? Um, guys like to go where they get paid. One, one thing I learned a long time, that's one thing I learned a long time ago, is that guys want security. So there was a play. This is all right. This is back in the day. Um, John Jansen once told me, and maybe I'm maybe I shouldn't him, but I'm going to because he once told me he's like I would never play for a guy like Steve Spurrier. I could never play for him. Just the blocking scheme, blah blah blah. Steve Spurrier comes after the first year. Jansen signed a contract extension. I asked him why. He's like security, and so that that speaks. That's where you go. So if you get to the money they want, yeah, I think he'd be back. I think it's a really good defensive line. I think you know that's. It's a really good group. It helps his numbers. Um, so I do think that he would. The chance they resign him, I think that's going to be tough. I do think in their mind that they, they, they're they going to try. I know that. But here's the problem. It goes back, again, the sale of the team. Who's going to authorize and when the money you can spend? When back in the – when Dan Snyder bought the team, that offseason, Trent Green was a free agent. For you longtime fans, you remember this. Trent Green was a free agent, and um, they – now, this is the difference here is that it was in a place in a trustee estate. So the trustees had to make the, the authorization to go spend money or not. They couldn't get authorization to make him an offer until like right before free agency. Well, by that point, he was already he already had received an offer from the Rams and wanted to take it. So they by the time they got authorization, it was too late. So then they had to turn around and make the trade for Brad Johnson. But the point is they had to wait a long time. And one of the questions that the coaches will have here or the, or the staff in the front office is who's going to be in charge of that? What will Dan Snyder authorize? How much is he really going to want to spend for another, for what's going to be somebody else's team? So that's going to be, so that's going to be the hard part there. I know the desire is to keep him, but you know, um, I don't know. So I don't, but I don't, I think there's a chance, but I don't know the percentage at this point. Yeah, I'm starch. Yeah, aka Yam in Japan. I need therapy for sure. I'm beyond down right now to the way this season went. So many empty promises, and all it goes back to the offseason and Bosch roster building. Again, not a question, but I'm gonna let you vent because that's what you're here for. So, yes, I don't I don't blame you for the feeling that way. And I do think there were some issues with roster building and free agency in particular. I think the draft, you know, I, I really like Jahan Dotson. I think Brian Robinson is a good player. You know, I think Chris Paul, I think that's a wait and see. Um, you know, Sam Howell, wait and see. For Darian Mathis, I think we need to see more because we just didn't see him. So, you know, um, I don't think it was a bad group there. And I think the previous class is pretty good too. For agency, though, you got to do better. And you have to, you know, and they're going to have to address some things there as well. Um, uh, so, you know, so here's a couple more. Patrick Lugo put the money on the old line and linebackers. And then John O said linebackers ignored also. Yeah, I did bring that up. And I, but I, but that's, Every year there's going to be some position that's going to be ignored. You just, you simply, it's hard to address every position. I know in that draft, there was a desire to get linebackers. They just, they ran out of picks. And so I think that's, it's hard, but yes, I do agree with you. Um, you have to, you have to go there. Raymond Jacquet, I don't know if I pronounced that right. Biggest draft needs, O-line, cornerback, and linebacker. Do I agree? Well, let's see what happens in free agency. And I can't believe we're talking about the draft right now, but I guess it's only a few months away. <laughs> um, O-line, yes. Cornerback, yes. Linebacker, yeah. I think those are definitely needs. I think I think they're going to want to probably want another running back. That I think just to pair with with Robinson and with Gibson, and I don't – with J.D. McKissick, two neck injuries in a row, I think that's awfully tough. So, I do, yeah, I do think those are going to be priorities. Then it depends on what you do in free agency. 
Um, and that, cause that always sets the tone for, for the draft. Um, Josh Leonard on Twitter wants to know any further updates on the potential sale of the team. How does that impact the off season? Well, I've talked a lot about how that impacts the sale. As far as the uh, um, potential sale, you keep hearing that it's going to be sold. And it does. Sometimes it depends on who you talk to about, is it going to be a full sale or not? And I know I keep hearing from people how much that Dan Snyder wanted the stadium to be his legacy. Well, that's not going to happen if he sells the team. Now, I think in an ideal world for him, if somebody came along and said, I'll give you $2 billion now, but I'm getting the team in five years, but you can build your stadium with this $2 billion, that might get it done. I don't know that that's going to happen. So I still, at this point, expect a full sale. Um, just, And I do think that my guess would be by March, you'll probably know who by late March, a new owner would be approved. That's a guess because I, th- I think there's a lot that I don't know, um, but I, that's a guess. But I, I can see it happening that fast. Uh, but I do think it's going to be a full sale. Everything I hear points to that. But every once in a while, you hear from somebody over there that says, well, I don't know. Not because they're thinking it's going to go a different way. You just you don't know for sure any of this because you know, like, well, we like somebody told me, I know that the stadium means a lot to them. That may be. But then you hear other things that certainly point definitely to a full sale. Here we go. Robert Parrish. I love watching back in the day with the Celtics. How can a head coach not know playoff scenarios? Team needs to know the implications of upcoming game. Well, I agree. You have to know that. I don't think it impacted any decision in that game. I know some people disagree with that, but I don't like they were going to play Carson Wentz. They knew they had to win the game because they, you know, maybe not. Clearly he didn't know that if Green Bay won that second game that they would be eliminated, but it wouldn't. I don't Based on everything I've heard leading into that game, it wouldn't have mattered. They they felt like the offense wasn't had stalled under Taylor Heineke, and that Wentz, based on how he looked against San Francisco, they also felt that Heineke was getting beaten up and that he was, they was getting worn down a little bit. So I think that impacted the decision too. I don't think it impacted anything on the field in that game as far as what he would have done. And you know, the biggest thing that impacted him his decision in that game Sunday was that last drive that the offense went in that twenty one play drive. That's why he stuck with Carson Wentz after halftime. Yes, they should know it. Yes, yes, yes. I agree with that. But I don't think it, of all the issues they have, you know, I think there were other issues that are far bigger. Um, you have, you know, but again, like it didn't impact. It, I don't feel it impacted that game. Somebody can disagree, but I don't see I don't see him going to Heineke because he says, oh, my God, if Green Bay wins in three hours, we could be out. So we better play Heineke now. If you thought Heineke, if you thought that he was going to lead you to win, you should have put him in the start. So, you know, again, and, and if Heine, and if Wentz hadn't had that drive, even though only threw four passes, it was a touchdown drive. It's what they want to see. If they hadn't had that, I do think Heineke goes in the second half. So that drive, more than anything, played into the decision um, more, more than anything else. Got a couple more minutes here. And I, let me get um, one more, one or two more things here. Let's see. King Slim. And I like that name, so I'm so I'm putting it up there. Regardless who goes out there, oh man, we st- I'm gonna put in parentheses, we stink. Very we suck. He said we suck. This is a podcast. Very disappointing. This coaching staff spent money and resources in the quarterback that didn't pay off at all. Just a bad gamble, and it will set us back. It was a bad, it, it was a gamble that they lost. You're right. There's no other way to put it. That I think they put a lot of stock into what he had done. And there were games where last year where he actually looked pretty good. And there certainly were games where he did not. And there were throws that you say, hey, if he did this in Washington with better receiving talent, what could it look like? I think I wondered about that too. And I thought he would be an upgrade. And, and certainly we were, I was wrong because he wasn't. And I think when, one thing that was understated for me was the fact that he was learning a new offense. Here's a guy that was holding the ball in offenses that he knew what was going to happen in an offense that he didn't. And I think that was not something that I took enough into account when saying what kind of move and when could it pay off. I did think it would take a little bit. I do remember talking about this at least a little bit. I didn't. I thought it would take a little bit to get into a flow because of that, but I didn't think it'd be the major issue because of that. And then you can say, well, you know. But I, I the other thing I think they underestimated was the loss of mobility. I think that was something that they deeply undermined and underestimated. And then the other part was along with that in the roster building is not building a line that can protect him. Because what we heard in the offseason was you need to protect a guy, you need to have give him weapons. Well, they had the weapons, but they didn't have the protection. And so I think that's where they erred is 
you go get a guy who doesn't have that kind of mobility, even if you thought he had more mobility than he did, he didn't have a lot. We didn't see a lot. So you had to do a better job of protecting him. And that's where they fell down. So that's something that, you know, so I will agree with you there. Then again, let's see, Robert Parrish again says, if guys are dinged up, do you play, do you, do you play them? Do you evaluate young players in this meaningless game? I think you play some young guys. I think it's going to be hard to get a full evaluation on one game um, because it's it just, it's hard. It's one game, but I do think you'll play guys. I wouldn't be surprised to see a guy like Chris Paul play against Sam Hall. I do think we'll play whether he starts or not. We'll see. Um, and then, you know, you may see some other guys There's not a lot of, I mean, maybe some of the younger corners, I don't know, but Dallas needs this game. So I do think they're going to play with as many of their guys as they can, but there will be some young guys they work in. Blaine Bowling wants to know, what have I heard from the staff about Hall's progress? I mean, I've heard that I do hear good things and I still hear that there's a ways to go, but I do hear like, you know, showing maybe some of the swag in practice a little bit that, that he showed at Carolina. Um, they like, I, what, here's what I know. I know they like his arm. They know that they feel like he's got a quick twitch. He's quick twitch thrower. And he's athletic. So, you know, in some, and I think what the other thing they like about him is that he's like, he's, he's short. He's not a big guy. I mean, he's not a tall guy. He's only like six one. So he's a shorter quarterback. He and Taylor are very similar like that, but he's thicker than Taylor. And so I think that's something that they like. And they, you know, that is a little bit harder to bring down because he's got a stronger, lower body. And I think they're, they like that. But as far as where he's at, you know, you hear that he's made progress with his footwork. Um, that he's looked better. He looked that running the scout team for six, seven weeks helped him. Um, but I do know, like, again, if they were, if this was for a playoff game or playoff spot, he's not playing because they don't think he's that ready. But I do think they, I definitely know they want to see him. And then we'll see more about his progress there, Blaine. Anyway, I will get one more question here. Um, oh, right, well, this is a little plug here. Raymond, this is not a question, but it's a compliment. So I'm going to put it up there. But Raymond Jacquet says, I hope I pronounced that right. I really hope you do this stuff during the off season. This is awesome. I will do some of these and Bram will join me sometimes. I'm going to do it a lot on my own. Um, and, um, you know, I think you know, we'll go from there, but anyways, Adam Fuquay, how much of the fan base do you think has been lost due to the name change? Winning cures a lot, but I've heard several people say they won't come back due to the name change. Well, I wanted to answer this one because I grew up in Cleveland. I was an Indians fan. They changed it to guardians. And I understand the connection to the name. I really do, because it felt like something was lost. Now, the difference between the Indians and, and Redskins, Guardians, and Commanders, um, and I'm not sure that either name is all that all that great, but the, with, the, with Cleveland, the look was the same. When, you, when I was watching them on TV, I didn't feel like I was watching a different franchise. When I'm watching the Commanders, you feel like you're watching something different because everything has changed. Like, with the Indians, with the Guardians, the script is the same. Like the C on the hat, well, they've always had a C on their hat, you know? And so sometimes they used to have Chief Wahoo, but that was done a few years ago. So it's a little bit different. So the winning, I will say, it absolutely helped. By the end of the season, you know, I'm watching this game. What I cared about when I was watching them all year was how are they developing? I didn't watch them win. I had fun watching them because they still, to me, I grew up in Cleveland. So they represented Cleveland. That's all that first part mattered more to me than the second part. I think with the Redskins, you get a lot more people who maybe didn't grow up necessarily in this area. So they last on to the Redskins part more than just the Washington. Cleveland's very provincial. So I think people there, it's a little, so that's where one of the differences, I do think the winning helped. The other difference to folks is it's been a longer time without winning for Washington and all the off the field stuff that I think combined with all that probably pushed some people away too. That's just my guess. Fans would know better than me on that because I don't, I don't know. You know, you guys are, you guys talk to other fans. I hear from fans. I know it was a factor, but I do know one thing I would say, Adam, is I say that winning would help. The problem is they don't test that theory. You have to have a good year. Like watching the, watching Cleveland this year in the, in the baseball playoffs, it was a fun year. It was a fun team. They picked a really, if they had gone 75 and 87, just had it, which is what some people expected because they were a young team. They had just done that. Then I think the name is a bigger issue, but they were good. They were exciting to watch. They're young, they're energetic, and they made it to the playoffs and they, they won around and they gave the Yankees a scare. That is what helped people get used to the name um, or at least accept that and just get behind the team. So anyway, folks, we're going to end on that one. I really appreciate you joining in. 
And I will be back with another podcast on Thursday going over what the decision ultimately was and why analyzing all that stuff. We'll probably be talking about a lot about Taylor, about Hi- about Sam Howell and what all this means. It should be a short one. And I will be back with keys and predictions this week. I know why, because the game doesn't matter. Still got to do it, folks. Got one more game left. Got to be a pro, right? But I, but maybe I'll, I'll try to make it more fun and get off that serious, take my serious football cap off and maybe have a little bit of fun with it too. So anyway, folks, I appreciate you joining me and I will talk to you next time.